great to uh, see you all here again. We're going to look at that passage from uh, Matthew 26, if you have that one open. This follows on from what had been already spoken in the last uh, couple of weeks, specifically just back when Jesus himself was coming before Caiaphas, the high priest. In verse 58, it says, but Peter followed at a distance. And then it went on to speak about what happened to the Lord Jesus as he was being interrogated by Caiaphas and the rest of the Sanhedrin. And so this passage is set up really as a contrast between the way Peter copes, the way Judas copes, and the way Jesus copes under intense personal scrutiny for their faith. And everything really in these couple of chapters, up until Jesus' crucifixion, is a demonstration of what Jesus had said about himself to his Heavenly Father and what he said about the disciples just earlier. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The disciples, the Apostle Peter here, is desiring to be with Jesus, to see what is happening. He's not doing it for sport, he's doing it for love. Judas, of course, is there because he arrested with the others Jesus, and we'll see his reaction as well. But remember, it's also a demonstration of what Jesus said about himself. Your will, Heavenly Father, be done. And so he, of course, as he perseveres with prayer, remember, is driven to further persevering prayer. And he's driven to act in accordance with the prayers he's prayed because he know God is working through him. And so what we find is an easy thing for us to know, a far harder thing for us to do. And that is, the more and more we pray about how God can help us, hopefully the more we're driven back to prayer and then to act upon those prayers. It's a bit like saying godliness drives us to further godliness. It drives us to God. But the reverse is also true. The initial step of making a decision to deny Jesus makes it easier for the next step to do it. If you don't repent, you then are more likely to embark upon the same behaviour once again. And it may get worse, as you'll see here with the Apostle Peter. He will be the corollary for us of Jesus. As Jesus is driven to rely upon God, in tough times he asks God for help, he's driven to further prayer. Peter, of course, is the opposite. And that is demonstrated straight up how verse 69 starts. Jesus, at the same time, is being interrogated by those with the most power, in that human sense, over his life. Caiaphas interrogating him. Peter, on the other hand, is verse 69. He walks into the courtyard, he's standing back a little distance, and then a servant girl, a lady with the least amount of power, comes to him. And we're supposed to see these contrasts as we go out. And of course, what we'll see is ourselves in Peter. Peter is often called the everyday man, because every day I find myself just like Peter. But the answer isn't going to be, do you see yourself as Peter, but that, do you remain like Peter? Peter did not remain like Peter. He did something about it, or just as importantly, he knew Jesus had done something about it. But back at the big, bad beginning, verse 69, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, a servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. And of course, his reaction is in verse 70, but he denied it before them all. So you can imagine the scenario, the girl is around the courtyard, probably with a number of those who had arrested Jesus from the earlier episode with Judas. Jesus is inside with those who had arrested him in power and authority. P Peter is there, but not wanting to be too close in order to be identified with Jesus. And I suspect a number of us feel like Peter in verse 70. That is, we have a spirit that is willing to be a Christian. We desire it, especially when you're sitting on here on a Sunday. We all desire to be Christians. You wouldn't be here otherwise, or at least you desire to know more about God, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But sometimes our desires don't let us do the things we know to be true. In other words, the spirit is willing, our desires are willing, we have a good and honest desire to follow Jesus. But when push comes to shove... I deny Jesus by either my words, my actions, and some of us will face this tomorrow morning at school, at uni, at places where you go to, where someone will ask you just a simple question that seems so innocuous, 
Nothing like Peter in the courtyard here. What did you do on Sunday? And in the back of your mind is to tell them about church, but it's the only thing that doesn't come out of your mind into your voice. We deny not by often sometimes the things we say, but by the things we don't say. Peter, though, of course, is faced with that reality. And he says, I do not know what you're talking about. Now, on the surface, Peter is a failure. And what hope is there for people like Peter? Especially if I read to you a verse like this in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 10. If you read these words, you generally want to ignore them at the earliest possible convenience because they become so frightening to your heart that to dwell on them too much may drive you to despair. But the Lord Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 32, whoever acknowledges me before others, I'll acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, hasn't Peter just done that? Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 to 33. Are you feeling any guilt yet? Well, in one sense, you should. But in, of course, another sense, if you're a Christian, you know how this all turns out. But in part, a reason that this passage is structured the way it is, is because the three denials of Peter correspond to three aspects of denial that Jesus himself comments on. And you can imagine it. Some people in the early church may have thought to themselves, how can we have such a terrible example of faith as Peter running this ship? It's going to crash headlong into human history and be a flop. We have got this man who categorically, we all know, denied Jesus, denied him. And you may think that about yourself. I've denied Jesus. I've been asked to say things on behalf of him. I've been asked to witness to my faith in work, in my family, in places that you'll go in the next week, let alone in the past. Am I like this verse of chapter 10, verse 32 to 33? And so what we have in this context going through Matthew 26 and 7 is, what do we do with the words that Jesus has spoken and that we ourselves, including Peter, have lived out almost to a T. Whoever disowns me before my father, I would disown before my father in heaven. And your question you should ask yourself is, why is Peter not disowned subsequent to this event to his heavenly father by the Lord Jesus? Why didn't Jesus, when he come back and said, come back to me, all you disciples, not you, not you, why not? Well, hang on to that. That'll be a question that hopefully will eventually be answered by the Lord Jesus and Peter himself. But of course, it's a real question. But at this point in the narrative, what we're supposed to see is sadly another truth. And that is the denials we make in our own life, if they don't lead to repentance, make it more likely for you to deny Jesus in stronger terms next time. There's really only two things, well, there's probably three, I suppose. You can just put it to the back of your mind, the fact that you deny Jesus and don't live for him, you haven't prayed for weeks, you haven't done anything that's Christian, you just leave it in the back of your mind, hoping God never notices. You can do that. That's living in sort of blissful, ignorant delusion. Or, of course, you could just assume it's not very important and that you'll try better next time, but you actually don't bring it to God in prayer. It's all your own strength, remember? even though you know that your spirit might be willing, but your flesh is weak. But the real answer is going to be, of course, bringing it back to the Lord for help each and every time. Peter's going to teach us a lesson. Let me give you the answer and you'll see how it comes out. Don't leave it until verse 75 when your life is completely broken and you've gone further and further down the path of sin before you realise you're broken and then weep bitterly. Weep bitterly at verse 70. Don't wait till verse 75. Peter waited, which meant the increasing likelihood of he would go further and further into sin and denying Jesus. You can see Matthew beautifully sets it up in verse 71. 
Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, Peter's physical actions of just going back a bit, it'd be like someone coming to our church and not feeling comfortable in the building and sort of standing outside for a whole host of reasons. But one of the reasons is certainly going to be they don't maybe feel comfortable being with other people or being seen to be in here. And Peter's a bit like that. He's fearful that he himself is going to be identified with Jesus, but yet he can't flee because he wants to find out what happens. And so he takes a, a step back, give him a chance to run away quickly if it all goes pear shaped. I don't know if you've ever been like that. You stand just further enough away from the problem to see into it, but far enough away that you can escape. This is Peter before us, but it doesn't work, does it? And of course, now others are involved. Peter said to the girl in large enough words, loud enough words, that others could hear. All the others now are hearing it from Peter. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. So in other words, his denial gets even stronger. And any person who's read Matthew's Gospel in the one sitting would have known exactly where this comes from. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus himself spoke about oaths. The promises we make, he says. In the oath in verse 33 of chapter 5 says, Again you have heard it, that was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath. You've made a promise before God, you keep it. Remember Peter's promises? Even if all deny you, even if all flee, I promise you the Lord Jesus, I promise, I promise, I promise. I promise. But his promises came to zero. You ever made promises to God? And then one day you realise you've broken them? I promise to read your word every day, Lord. I promise to pray. I promise. A week's gone by and it just slipped your mind. You've we all make promises that we fail to keep. The Lord Jesus says, do not break your oath, but fulfil to the Lord. That's the Lord Jesus Peter had made promises to his Lord that you have made. I tell you, do not take an oath, do not swear by heaven or by earth. Why? Because when you break it, you're under the punishment of the oath that you've broken. I promise God, well, the promises that Peter made in the end were demonstrating his own humanness. I'm sure we've all made promises we failed to keep. Some very serious. We've made promises before God in marriage and haven't been able to keep them, or our partner didn't keep them and they broke them. We've made promises before each other about how we're going to care for one another, how we're going to live. You made promises maybe to your children that you've broken and it's been easier to ignore them rather than today say sorry to a five-year-old or a 15-year-old. We've all made promises that we have failed to keep. What are you going to do with it? Brush it off? Does it matter? And see, the more brushing off and don't matter leads to the greater opportunity to stuff up in the future. Why? Because there's only two good answers that we get from the scriptures. You either admit that you've done the wrong thing and receive help. Remember, don't wait until verse 75 to weep bitterly about the things you've done. Weep bitterly when you know that you've done the wrong thing and bring it back to God. Peter, of course, sadly, the third time's not a charm, for the Apostle Peter. Why? Because he didn't repent and therefore makes it more likely to stuff up the next time. And this is exactly what happens. Verse 73. After a little while, those standing there, so again, remember the Lord Jesus, the attacks on him get more and more vehement. The Lord Jesus, when those attacks get more vehement, does not respond with anger or denial, but with truth. In verse 64, when the attack was getting at its most pointed, he responds by saying, I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So when push come to shove, Jesus said the truth to Caiaphas. I'm going to come and judge you, Caiaphas. You're judging me, but sadly you're so mistaken. I am your eternal judge. And I come back as the eternal judge 
you are going to be my footstool. Well, why isn't Peter that footstool? He's denying Jesus. He's made promises to Jesus he couldn't fulfill. And it just gets worse for the Apostle Peter. You can see it in verse 73. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and he said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Now, I don't know whether you've been in countries where your accent gives you away. Some of us, though, I assume if we travelled to some other churches, maybe in Vaucluse or Bellevue Hill, our dress sense, our actions or our, our voice may give us away. Uh, this is the Apostle Peter. He is Bogan Galilean. Most of the old manuscripts in other parts of after the New Testament always testify that the, that the Galileans were basically the down and outers. They weren't speaking proper Aramaic or Hebrew, mainly because they're half, bred, half breeds as well, intermingled with many other nationalities. And so he is being called out. He can't stop being the person he is. Oh, but he can, you see. Verse 73 goes on to verse 74. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them. Now, this is not like tradey swearing on a Monday morning where he's swearing you know, F's and P's and Q's he wishes. No, this is far more serious than that. This is the type of cursing and swearing that maybe you have heard said in films. I swear on my mother's grave, that type of swearing. In the Old Testament, it may have been like King David, who had a very popular one that became popular later on in the Old Testament. I swear on behalf of God that he would deal with me ever so severely. The ever so severely is a point of death or the judgment of God will come upon me. God, deal with me ever so severely if it is found out that I know that man. God, punish me with your eternal punishment, God, that if it's found out I know that man. Why did Jesus not punish him ever so severely when he himself has called upon God to do so if it was found out he was lying. Especially when the most famous denial that the Lord Jesus had already spoken about in Matthew 12, no doubt will be ringing, not out, no doubt in his own ears, but in the ears of anybody else after the Lord Jesus returns, that why is Peter allowed to come back into the church when he's basically a rank failure? Many of you will know these verses in Matthew 12 and have probably at various times felt so guilty that you fear you may live in them. Matthew 12, verse 30, starts by saying, whoever is not with me is against me. Well, Peter seems pretty against Jesus. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander will be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Oh, hasn't the Apostle Peter just done that? And so the people will ask that question. Peter, your denial of Jesus was taking a vow before God, bringing curses upon your head if you were found to be a liar. Immediately the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Because he denied Jesus once, didn't repent, and made the next action all the more likely, which I suspect is very similar to us. That's why Peter's the everyday man. When we do the wrong thing and know it and refuse to admit our guilt before God and the reason is not that we merely admit our guilt, is that we receive forgiveness, you see. Peter eventually received forgiveness for that. But it would have been awesome if he could have received it at verse 70, after the first denial, rather than let his life go down, down, and further down. Maybe you've been the same at various points. You've gone further and further away from the Lord. There have been points at each part of the journey where you could have responded in repentance and ask for help. But of course, the end is still beautiful. And that is, Peter remembered that he himself does not deserve God's forgiveness. And that the curse 
that he himself called down upon himself, God, deal with me ever so severely, that the punishment that you could hap let happen to me only happen if I'm found out to be a liar. He's found out he's a liar. He knows it. And God says, I'm not going to send that punishment to you. I'm going to send it on my son. Jesus is going to take that punishment. And so the early church, and hopefully you and I know that the only sin that is left unforgivable, unforgiven, is a person who dies rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. So blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the continual rejection of Jesus Christ as your Lord. And so when you come to hear the Apostle Peter, yes, you could repent at verse 70. You could repent at the next time at verse 72. But praise the Lord that Peter realised he could still repent when it comes to verse 75. And that's you and I, friends. At any point, we can come before God and ask for his help. The judgment of God, if it is not too disastrous that Peter could be forgiven, not too serious in one sense that anybody is outside of his love, then that is you and me. At any point, we can come before him. Do not wait. As you can see, this is going to be contrasted, sadly, with Judas in the neighbouring verses here. The context, of course, is the same as previous. We've got three examples of Jesus, Peter and Judas, but they're happening all at the same time in terms of how time works. Judas is no doubt inside the building as a witness to the charge, but he has a different reaction, doesn't he? Verse 3, he sees the outcome... When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So Judas feels guilty. He feels absolutely that he has done the wrong thing. Injustice is going to happen, not justice. He feels guilty. You don't need to be a Christian to feel guilty. The world is full of people who feel guilty. I'm sure many of you who, before you became a Christian, felt guilty for things that you'd done, and maybe rightly so. We all can feel guilt, but what do you do with it? Now, the key thing for us, and hopefully you never have to talk about this, but Judas's suicide is not a demonstration in a universal way of his guilt before God. Many of us, and certainly I, have known people some ministers of the gospel, faithful people who due to circumstances in their life at some point sadly felt unable to cope and one of the things they've done is either attempted suicide or have committed suicide. Suicide is not the demonstration that you are a non-Christian. Judas's demonstration of that is what did he do with his guilt? What are his options? He could have come back before God and thrown himself before God, not just the money at the actual temple. We all have guilt, whether you're a Christian or not. But if you're a non-Christian with guilt, what do you do with it? You either have to bear it, ignore it, ask for forgiveness from those you've wronged. Non-Christians do that all the time. But the only guilt that matters in one sense is the guilt between you and God. He felt guilty that he had hurt his friend Jesus because he did not still recognise this Jesus as his Lord and Messiah. I'm sure in your family many people have felt guilty for hurting one another. It doesn't make them Christians, it just makes them human. But what do you do with your guilt? Judas, of course, knew he'd done the wrong thing. He knew he had betrayed his friend. He had done the wrong thing and so he throws the money back. Obviously he knew that wouldn't result in anything, but he saw himself being unable to profit from this thing. And it demonstrates that the leaders did not care about Judas. The leaders did not care about justice. They only cared about their own necks, remember, pragmatism. We want Jesus guilty. We want him crucified. The fact that you may have told lies or not, that's got nothing to do with us. That's your responsibility. And so Judas, overcome with guilt, overcome with remorse, then he goes and hangs himself because he himself can't bear the guilt. And sadly, Neither can you. Now, most of us won't choose the end that Judas chose. But you may choose a whole lot of different ends that aren't Christian, ignoring, justifying it away, giving yourself reasons why you did the things you did that make it seem more likely you're not a bad person. We all do things with guilt that maybe aren't the key thing. The key thing is, 
handing that guilt over to the Lord Jesus so you receive forgiveness. Otherwise, guilt crushes you. Guilt crushes you. Unless, of course, you just imagine it away. But for a lot of us, guilt is crushing, soul-destroying. Jesus didn't die so that you would remain feeling guilty before him. He did it so that he would take away the guilt that is rightly yours and place it on himself. That's why it's called Good Friday, not half Good Friday. It's totally good, totally awesome. Are you going to avail yourself of that goodness? Yes, be like the Apostle Peter. It would be awesome if we could do it before verse 75, but sometimes we try and solve all our own problems and when we run out of our own solutions, then we come to God and realise that we were stuffed all along. And God says, come before me as soon as you realise, as soon as the Spirit speaks to you that I want to forgive you, I want to love you. The text ends, of course, sadly, with the chief priests in verses 6 and onwards In every gospel, there is at least one example, and it's not always the same example. The writers choose one for their own purposes. Many things happen, of course, they could have chosen. Matthew chooses the hypocrisy of the leaders with their desire to reintegrate or not the money back into the temple. In other words, they're so desperate to maintain law and order, the right thing, they're so desperate to do the right thing that they refuse to bring the money back into the temple because it's blood money. But yet, of course, they've just been completely unconcerned with Judas, with justice, with Jesus. But yet they're so desiring to obey the law. We all, as we said in the past, can be like that. The law is the right thing. The law is the principle. Your heart is less important. When Jesus says no, the heart is very important in your obedience to the law. Otherwise, you could obey a law when your heart's not in it. Sadly, just like the chief priests here It shows them to be on the side of injustice. I have betrayed innocent blood. They don't care, even though Judas knows that Jesus was innocent. Because for them, it wasn't about whether he was innocent or not. It's about whether he could be proven guilty before their courts. That's what mattered. But for us, of course, we know that Jesus was innocent of all charges. But the only thing he wanted to do through his crucifixion was the guilt that we'd all feel. And to fast forward to Friday, we know upon the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They do not know that they're killing the Lord of glory. And for all of us, maybe like these people here, there's still an opportunity, knowing, of course, that Paul was probably one of these crowd, that we can still receive the same forgiveness that the Apostle Peter received after verse 75. But you have to avail yourself of him. You have to come before him. And recognize that you can't solve your own guilt. Not only that, you can't make yourself better with God. Yes, you can go away from here and try and be a good boy or a good girl and say, I'm never going to do those things again. I'm never going to hurt that person again. I'm always going to say sorry to my family. Non-Christians can do that all the time. It just has no impact in your life with God. You can all make a healthy society and in the end, Jesus will say, big deal. The only society that counts is a society of forgiven people through the blood of the Lord Jesus. That's what really counts. So what do you do with your guilt? Don't rationalise it. Don't forgive yourself. Don't try and move on. Don't put it to the back of your mind and be ignorant of the consequences. Don't be deluded that it didn't really matter. Bring it to the Lord. It's the only thing that does matter. And it's the very thing he wants you to do because it's the very thing that Good Friday achieved as eternally wiped away. So the offer is there. Whether you're a non-Christian or been a Christian for years, avail yourself of Jesus Christ's forgiveness. It is powerful enough to forgive every sin committed in this earth. And then be strengthened, like Jesus was, to become more like him. And maybe more like the Apostle Peter subsequent to this, to be more like Jesus. Where we can start praying prayers, Lord, yet not I my will, but your will be done. Strengthen me to follow your will. Heavenly Father, not under pressure, give up, or under pressure, deny, but maybe the next time, under pressure, I'll ask for your help, I'll ask for your strength, and when I behave in a way that's different, I can say in my own heart and mind how glorious it is to see God at work. And then in 12 months' time, 
you'll see yourself in an entirely different light. The person who now doesn't give up because I'm under pressure, but actually gives God the glory for how he gets me through those times of pressure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks. Like the Apostle Peter here, we ourselves can take for ourselves the forgiveness that Christ has won for us on the cross. So Heavenly Father, as we take hold of that the first time, or as we continue to take hold of that over many times, we also pray, Lord, that you will strengthen us to be more like you. You'll strengthen us to be more godly. You'll strengthen us to make promises and keep them. You'll you'll strengthen us to do your will each and every day. And when we don't, we won't wait until we continue to struggle. At the first opportunity, Lord, we'll recognise who we are and who you are, a loving and forgiving Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.